Okay, well, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, so first, just a couple of notes. Um, my finals week office hours are different than during the regular quarter, um, so I've just put them up here on the board. Um, I'll be around for, you know, just over an hour extra this Friday afternoon, and then also Monday morning. Um, I've got two final exams Monday back to back, so I've got one right before your final even. So anyway, I'll be here at 8.30 in the morning for just a half hour before my earlier final, and then I'll be around for a little bit after your final as well. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, I'll be around as well, although most of you probably have no interest in seeing me after the quarter's over. Um, but anyway, these are my finals week office hours. Let me also remind you that your final is next Wednesday, no, no, next Monday, um, and it's at 11.30. 11.30 to 1.30, so it's not at the regular class time, so make sure you're all aware of that, 11.30 on Monday. Um, and the format will be the same as the second midterm, so it'll be closed book, closed notes, except you can use the property table handout, as well as a three by five note card with equations written on both sides if you choose. So that's uh, gonna be something that we'll talk about more on Friday. In fact, Friday um, will be teacher evaluation day. It'll also be a review day, um, a discussion of the final exam day, and we'll also finish up this discussion of um, the Brayton cycle uh, Friday. So just a little heads up on all of that. So let's just get back to where we were last time. Oh, yeah, go ahead. No, I only have this one section of thermo, and I only have one final exam, and I really can't make a whole new final exam for one student. So um, in general, no. Now, if you have like back-to-back -back finals, you might want to talk to the other instructor, or if you have three finals. Um, but there's really not a whole lot th that I'm really able to do. I mean, if, if it's a really difficult situation, I, I could probably let you take a final exam from uh, old year, you know, maybe give you one from 10 or 15 years ago. It's not like the thermodynamics has changed. Um, so that would be a possibility. Um, but, uh, you know, I really want to talk to you individually about that and, you know, no guarantees. Um, anyway, so, um, and by the way, if I do end up doing that, the only time I would have to do it would be during my final exam Wednesday morning at 9.10. So that may or may not work out for students anyway. Um, anyway, so we're now talking about the first real cycle that we're going to analyze, which we call the Brayton cycle. Now, the Brayton cycle is a gas power cycle. Um, specifically, it's an air standard cycle. Um, you may recall from last time that we're looking at a thermodynamic cycle, um, but we're actually now looking at the individual, individual components within that cycle. <coughs> and <clears throat> these are all single stream steady flow types of equipment, right? Uh, a turbine, a compressor, uh, flow through a pipe within a heat exchanger. Um, so we have the ability to do this analysis, but we've never quite looked at the analysis in this way before. So last time we discussed the general nature of the Brayton cycle, uh, the air standard Brayton cycle, the simple air standard Brayton cycle. And in doing so, we realized that the equations are, again, just the same as we've seen before. The only difficulty is how do we put them all together in one cycle problem. So what I intend to do today is go through a couple of example problems, and then we'll move on and talk about the non-ideal, but still simple air standard Brayton cycle. So the first thing I want to do today, then, is an example. So if we could have the computer on one of the screens, please. And this is actually problem 999, but from a sixth edition. So that's the example that we're going to do. Um, looks like it's up here now. Let me read it to you. So it says, we have a stationary gas turbine power plant that operates on a simple ideal Brayton cycle with air as the working fluid. Um, the air enters the compressor at 95 kilopascals, 290 Kelvin, <coughs> and enters the turbine at 960 kilo, I'm sorry, 760 kilopascals, 1100 Kelvin. It says heat is transferred to air at the rate of 35,000 kilojoules per second. 
determine the power delivered by this power plant. And I'm only going to do part A of this particular problem. Um, the only method we're going to use, at least in this class, my section of ME301, is the method of ideal gases with constant specific heats at room temperature. Okay. Um, you know, we can call this the cold air standard cycle. Um, that's often what it's called. Um, part B would use variations in specific heat with temperature, and to do that, we'd have to know how to use table A17, the air tables. Um, we'd also have to know how to find our specific heats as a function of temperature, and none of that is material that we've talked about. So we're only dealing with the cold air standard that is constant specific heats at room temperature. All right, so first of all, as we set up this problem, um, we'll note that it is a cycle, right? So we're going to have a compressor. Um, we're going to have our heat exchanger, our combustion chamber, if you will. So I'll just put a C for compressor, um, CC for combustion chamber, which is where we're going to add the heat. And in fact, it even gives us a rate of heat input. And that's, what, 35,000 kilojoules per second. Um, coming out of the combustion chamber, we're going to go into our gas turbine, and the gas turbine is going to produce a certain amount of power output. I'll call this W dot T. And then we're going to go into the big giant heat exchanger that we call the environment, and we'll transfer heat um, out of our air. And that'll bring us right back to the conditions of point one, entering the compressor. Um, by the way, I probably should have shown that there's definitely going to be some work input required by the compressor, so I'll put a W dot C like that. Uh, I need a new pen. Okay, so this is the basic cycle as we set it up. Now, we're given a variety of data, so we're told that at the compressor inlet, which is point one, we know the pressure and temperature, so P1 and T1 are both known, uh, 95 kilopascals, and a temperature at point one of 290 <laughs> Kelvin. And then we know the inlet to the turbine as well. So let's put the rest of our state points, one, two, three, and four. So we also know P3 and T3, um, 760 kilopascal, and the temperature is 1100 Kelvin. So this is very common for these types of problems. We typically would know the conditions in the environment. I mean, after all, isn't it the environment, the inlet to the compressor of this gas turbine engine? So P1 and T1 are known, and those are pretty typical environmental conditions, right? Um, and we also know what is going to be the temperature leaving our combustion chamber. Some engineer somewhere, maybe you in the future, will have designed that combustion chamber and you will know what the maximum temperature is and pressure is coming out of this particular device. So um, P3 and T3 are often known. Um, and of course, if we've designed this engine properly, you know, the engineer, the designer, the user will know what is the rate of fuel that has to be used and therefore how much combustion energy is being released. Um, we know, of course, that for our simple air standard cycle here, there's no real combustion chamber. It's just heat exchange equal to the amount of heat that would be liberated by the combustion process based on the fuel that's moving through this engine. So that's given to us, Q.H, 35,000. And we're trying to find the power delivered. So that's W dot. Now let me note that the power that's delivered is not the turbine power, right? It's the net power. That's what we're trying to find. And that's the difference between the power output of the turbine and the power input requirement for the compressor. Um, recall, as we talked about last time, that the compressor and the turbine are going to share a single shaft and the rotation on the turbine is going to provide all the power needs of the compressor. Um, it's only the power that crosses the boundary, the net power output, that's going to be connected to our electric generator and producing the work output that we're trying to find. So it's the W dot net that we're looking at. Make sure you read these problems carefully. Sometimes they'll ask for turbine output power. Sometimes they'll ask for compressor input power. Sometimes they'll ask for the net power output. When it says power delivered by this plant, the assumption is that the whole gas turbine engine is the power plant. It is the power plant. Um, and therefore, it's just the network that we're really trying to calculate. Now, I'm actually going to add to this problem. Well, let's find a couple of other things. Let's also find the thermodynamic efficiency of this cycle. And let's also find the mass flow rate of air <coughs> moving through this cycle. So I'm basically starting with this problem in 999, but I'm adding to it just a little bit. Now, 
the basic methodology of solution is really pretty straightforward. We would understand that in order to find the power, we need to have some relationship between the power and other variables that are either given in the problem or can be found. And probably the easiest way to do this is just to recall that the thermodynamic efficiency is nothing more than the net power output divided by the rate of heat input. If we can find the thermodynamic efficiency using some equation that we've dealt with in the past and we're given Q dot H, then to find W dot net uh, should be really simple for us, right? Um, we'll just multiply that efficiency by the heat input rate and that gives us the power output. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, I might also note that when we solve the thermodynamics of the problem, in other words, when we find our thermodynamic states um, and ultimately we get all our enthalpies, or in this case it will be Cp times temperature changes, that will equal our enthalpies, um, we should be able to find everything on a per unit mass basis. Uh, I mean, for instance, we'll know that the turbine work on a per unit mass basis is just Cp times the temperature change across that turbine, so T3 minus T4. Um, we'll know that the compressor work on a per unit mass, mass basis is Cp T1 minus T2. Um, we'll know that the heat input on a per unit mass basis is just going to equal Cp times, well, T3 minus T2, right? Remember, these Cp delta Ts are the enthalpy changes, which is the same as our work per unit mass. And like all these problems, as we discussed last time, we'll assume there's no kinetic energy, no potential energy changes, there's no heat loss into the surroundings. Um, so all these work and heat transfer terms are just enthalpy changes, which are Cp times temperature changes for an ideal gas with constant specific heat. And since this problem specifically says room temperature, in fact, all of our problems are going to be at room temperature, you could put a little O here on the CP term, just to remind you that that's the room temperature data, and it's from table A2, part A, right? All right, so we know this information. Now, as you look at this, you also realize that we don't have everything. I mean, we do know T1 and we do know T3, so that's not a problem. But we also need T2 and T4, and that's not really a problem either, if you recall that the processes are isentropic at least in the case of this ideal process, it's isentropic from one to two, and it's isentropic from three to four. So we would also recognize that there's relationships between temperature and pressure, which is why they gave us a pressure to begin with. For instance, we know that the temperature ratio equals a pressure ratio raised to the K minus one over K power for an isentropic process. So this certainly applies from one to two in the compressor. Um, but also it applies in the turbine, right? The ratio T3 over T4 is equal to the pressure ratio to the K minus one over K as well. So since these are isentropic processes, we can use these relationships, right? In fact, now you can see that we can indeed find the temperature at point two and at point four, right? Um, we know T1, we know the pressure ratio. Um, after all, the pressure ratio is just P max over P min which is P2 over P1, or P3 over P4, um, or since P2 and P3 are the same, P1 and P4 are the same, we can also just write this as P3 over P1. Remember that in the Brayton cycle, heat input and heat rejection are done at constant pressure. So P2 and P3 are the same, P1 and P4 are the same. Uh, and we know P3 and P1, right? They're given in the problem statement. So we know the pressure ratio. K is just a function of the gas. It's just 1.4 for air. We're going to have to look that up, but, well, it's a number you'll probably memorize eventually. Um, we can find uh, T2 in the same way that we found T4, again, knowing the pressure ratio and K, and we know T1, so we can find T2. So everything is known. Once we have all this information, we can go back above. We can find the work and the heat transfer terms. Um, we can then basically solve the problem. Now, what about the thermodynamic efficiency? We, we do have to quantify that so that we can find the power given the heat input rate. Well, that's probably the easiest of them all, right? The thermal efficiency um, specifically for a Brayton cycle of this type is just one over, I'm sorry, one minus one over the pressure ratio to the K minus one over K power. So we use that equation as well. So, so we know everything, right? These are all equations we've seen already. 
Um, I, I've rewritten them here just for illustration. Um, we'll look at these here presently. By the way, one other thing I might want to note, if we already have all of our temperatures and we can therefore find all of our work and heat transfer terms, I can also find the thermodynamic efficiency by just simply noting that this is the turbine work minus the compressor work over the heat input. Um, I would just do this on a per unit mass basis so that I don't really have to worry about the mass flow rate. And then lastly, I would note that if I'm trying to find the mass flow rate, there's many ways to do it, but probably the easiest one is just to recall that Q dot H is the mass flow rate times lowercase qh, right? Um, and therefore, the mass flow rate is just q dot h over qh. So we have all the equations. All these have been discussed previously. And now let's just go through the math and solve what we need to solve for. Um, yeah, so um, I think we don't need the computer up anymore. And that will give us better viewing access to the right half of the classroom. All right, so where do we begin? Well, why don't we just find the thermodynamic efficiency? I mean, that's one of the easiest things. So the pressure ratio, again, is the maximum over the minimum pressure, which is 760 over 95, which is exactly 8. And therefore, the thermal efficiency is 1 minus 1 over, and I guess I better go into my table, right? I got to go into table A2 part A, and I need CP and I need K. K is 1.4, and CP is 1.005. Kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. So now we can find the thermal efficiency. So 8 raised to the 0 0.4 over 1.4. And we go through a little bit of math. And we end up with 0.448. Or if you prefer, you can write it as a percentage, 44.8%. All right, so that's one thing we need. Um, now that I have this, now I can, um, well, I can find the work input, right? The, the power requirement. I'm sorry, it's not input, it's a network output. So we would go back up. We would note that the thermal efficiency is the net power output divided by the rate of heat input. And this is 0.448 W dot net over 35,000 kilojoules per second. And we get that the net power output is then going to equal 15,680 kilojoules per second, which we know is a kilowatt. So there's the power output. Okay. All right, and then we can find the mass flow rate pretty easily. Might as well do that next. So, ooh, I can't really do that quite yet, can I? Because I need to find my thermodynamic properties at more than just states one and three. So, not quite ready to do the mass flow rate yet. Um, why don't we do the compressor and the turbine analysis next? And we actually may not need all of this data to solve the problem, but we're going to do it anyway. So, for the compressor, again, we'd recognize that T2 over T1 is a pressure ratio to the K minus 1 over K. Um, by the way, we already know the value of the pressure ratio to the K minus 1 over K because we solved for it earlier within the thermal efficiency. So you can save yourself a minute if you just push your store memory button while you're working through this problem on your calculator. So anyway, we have this information. Um, all we need to do is solve for T2. So T2 over T1. T1 was given in the problem statement. Um, we do have to convert this from... Celsius to Kelvin. No, I'm sorry, we're given Kelvin, so no conversion necessary. We just divide by 290 Kelvin, and again, this equals 8 to the 0.4 over 1.4, and therefore T2 is solved to be 525.3 Kelvin. And we may as well work on the turbine. Um, same basic equation, right? Temperature ratio 
equals pressure ratio to the K minus one over K. Um, T3 is known, it's given as 1100 Kelvin. So over T4 equals eight to 0 0.4 over 1.4. And let's just go through the math. I'll let you do the details at home, but we get T4 of 607.2. Kelvin. Okay. So now we can finish up the problem. All right, so as we finish up this problem, um, why don't we find QH? So QH is CP times T3 minus T2. So 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. And then the temperature difference, 1100 minus T2, which is 525.3 Kelvin. And this gives us the heat input per unit mass of 577.6 kilojoules per kilogram. And then lastly, we can find the mass flow rate now, Q dot H over QH. So 35,000 kilojoules per second, and then divided by 577.6 kilojoules per kilogram, and we get 60.6 .6 kilograms per second. And there's the problem. Now, there's lots of parts of this problem for sure, right? Um, I don't want you to think that just because we've looked at this before that it's immediately a simple problem, um, but it's a very straightforward problem. We need to use an equation to find the thermodynamic efficiency. We need to use the first law equation in order to find the heat input or the work associated with the turbine and the compressor, right, the CP delta T. Um, we need to use the equations for an ideal gas for an isentropic process as we find the temperature coming out of the compressor and the temperature coming out of the turbine. Um, but as long as we understand all that material from previously in class, then it's really just a matter of going through a very specific set of equations to get the answer that we're looking for. Um, one thing that we could also do at this point if we were interested is just validate the thermodynamic efficiency. Um, we know that the thermodynamic efficiency is the turbine minus the compressor work over the heat input. Um, we can actually note that the Turbine work is CP times the temperature change across the turbine. Compressor work, CP delta T compressor. Heat input, CP delta T across the combustion chamber. Um, I think as we looked at last time, the CPs are all gonna cancel. And this is then just T3 minus T4 minus T2 minus T1 over T3 minus T2. And if you plug in all the numbers and you make sure that you're consistent and use Kelvin, then you get exactly the same result you get 0.448. So this just validates the results that we found previously. Um, if we wanted to, we could find the work per unit mass associated with the turbine. We could find the work per unit mass associated with the compressor. I mean, we could explicitly find those values if we're interested. Um, there's lots of things we can find that weren't specifically asked for in this problem, uh, but this is a pretty good problem. Yes? Um, how did we know that it was Ideal Brayton cycle? Um, well, I mean, it says so in the problem statement. It says um, it operates on a simple ideal Brayton cycle with air as a working fluid. Um, but frankly, that's all we're covering in this class. We're, at least here, when we get to chapter nine, we're only dealing with the Brayton cycle, not any of the other cycles that are discussed in chapter nine. We're only dealing with the simple cycle, which means you have a compressor, a combustion chamber, a turbine, and the environment as a heat exchanger. Um, that's the only thing we're going to look at in this class. And when it's simple and ideal, it's always isentropic? Ideal means isentropic. So yes, the fact that it says ideal means that it's an isentropic process. And you know that's why we're able to use these, well, this relationship here and then this one directly above, right? These are both isentropic relationships. And that means that, um, well, I mean, and that means ideal Ideal and isentropic are the same thing, so yeah, that's what that would imply. If it says non-ideal process, then we would have to factor in the isentropic efficiency of the compressor and turbine, which is actually something we'll get to before the end of the day. So any further questions on this example? Now again, I understand these could be confusing, so let's just look at another one. It looks similar, but it's not quite the same, and this problem will be 
from the seventh edition of your book. So if we could put the computer back up on one of these screens. Uh-oh. No, I'm wrong. It's from the eighth edition of the book. Okay. Okay, 988. All right, so th this is the problem we're going to look at now. So this is from the eighth edition, 988. All right, so this problem, let me read it. Um, again, it's up here on the board. It says an aircraft engine operates on a simple ideal Brayton cycle with a pressure ratio of 10. Heat is added to the cycle at a rate of 500 kilowatts, although personally I would have said 500 kilojoules per second, but it's the same thing. It says air passes to the engine at a rate of one kilogram per second, and the air at the beginning of the compression is at 70 kilopascals, zero degrees C. Determine the power produced by this engine and its thermal efficiency. Use constant specific heats at room temperature. So again, it's a simple Brayton cycle. It's an ideal Brayton cycle. So all the equations that we've talked about previously are still going to apply. Well, we're dealing only with air as an ideal gas with constant specific heats. Um, this problem's a little bit different than the last one. Um, in the last one, we knew the state going into both the compressor and the turbine, but we did not know the mass flow rate. This one, we know the mass flow rate, but we only know the temperature and pressure going into the compressor. So we'll use the same set of equations, but we're not going to use them in the same order. But the setup is more or less the same. Um, so again, let's just set up this particular problem. So we'll have our compressor. We'll have our combustion chamber where we're going to add heat. Um, let me also show the work that will be added in the compressor. Come out of the combustion chamber into our turbine where we have some work output. And then lastly into the big heat exchanger of the environment which then brings us right back to state point one. Um, by the way, we rarely calculate the rate of heat output or heat rejection from the cycle, the Q dot L term, it's, it's not that we can't find it. It's simple enough to find. It uses the same equations we've already used, but we just don't need it. I mean, frankly, we don't care how much heat is lost into the environment. Now, if I were to combine a cycle problem like this with the second law problem where you had to figure out, um, you know, whether the process is real or ideal, um, or impossible, well, then we'd really have to know more about heat transfer out into the environment. But that's not what we're going to do here. Okay, We're not doing that. We're only looking at the cycle, and we don't really care about how much heat is lost into the environment. Um, that's just the exhaust from this gas turbine engine, and however much is exhausted into the environment is just fine with us, right? On the other hand, we pay for the fuel that produces that heat input, so that's very much of interest to us, right? We're always trying to minimize our costs, minimize the fuel we use. At the same time, we're always trying to maximize the work output because that's our benefit, right? That's the work we're selling to our customers as electricity. Um, in other words, we always want to make sure that the thermal efficiency is as high as possible, maximizing our work output, minimizing our heat input. In other words, maximizing the money we make when we sell our work and minimizing the money we have to spend when we buy our heat. All right, so this is the problem. Let's write down what we know. So here we're specifically told that the pressure ratio is 10. Um, the heat input, Q dot H, is 500 kilojoules per second, or kilowatts. The mass flow rate is a kilogram per second. At the beginning of compression, that would be 0.1, so P1 is 70 kilopascals, and the temperature is zero degrees C. Okay. Um, by the way, this says it's an aircraft engine, so these pressure and temper temperature conditions are not unusual, well, at least for an airplane that's flying you know, several thousand feet up in the sky. Right? The pressure is going to be lower than atmospheric. Atmospheric pressure is, what, 101 kilopascals? The temperature is going to be lower than our typical atmospheric temperature, so zero makes sense. All right, so what do we want to do now? We're trying to find, again, the power produced. And we're also trying to find the thermodynamic efficiency. All right. So 
Again, many ways to solve this problem using all the variety of equations we've just looked at. Um, I don't know that I really want to write down each of those basic equations that I wrote down previously. Um, I did them in the context of the previous problem. But it's all the same equations that we have to utilize in this problem. So I think what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to kind of talk you through it. Um, if we're trying to find the net power output, then probably, well, at least one way we could do it, we could do it similar to the way we did it before, but it would probably be easy to just say that this is the mass flow rate, and then times the turbine work minus the compressor work, which is our net work per unit mass. Um, so this is the way I'm going to find the net power output in this particular problem. And that means I'm going to have to specifically find the work associated with the compressor and the turbine, um, at least on a per unit mass basis. So this is going to be Cp T2 minus T1. And this will be Cp T3 minus T4. All right, so that's how I'm going to find the net power output. And of course, to find T2 and T4, I'm going to have to do work similar to what I did before. Um, and then, of course, finding the thermodynamic efficiency, once we have the net power output, then the thermodynamic efficiency is just going to be that net power divided by the rate of heat input, which was given to me in the problem statement. So um, we should be able to find both of this, uh, that is, the net power as well as the efficiency, pretty, pretty easily, you know, based on the equations we've already seen. However, again, things are a little bit different, right? We don't know T3. So one other equation that we're going to have to use is the fact that the heat input per unit mass is Cp times T3 minus T2. So first we're going to deal with the compression through the compressor and we'll get the temperature of point 2. And then since we know the heat input rate, um, we can just divide the heat input rate by the mass flow rate and that's going to be the heat input per unit mass, and then we can plug it into the equation directly to the left of this, and we can find the temperature point three, and then we can deal with the isentropic expansion through the turbine. So I've written some of the equations here, but not all. So let's just start at state point one. So uh, we'll note that T2 over T1 is a pressure ratio to the K minus one over K. Um, I guess I better go back to table A2A and again note the values of K and Cp. So these are the same as we had just a moment ago. So we'll find T2 now. So T2 over T1. T1 is 0 degrees Celsius or 273.15 Kelvin. Yep, sorry. Um, we're also given the pressure ratio of 10. So 10 to the 0 0.4 over 1.4 power. And this allows me to find T2. And we get 527.1 Kelvin. Okay. Now we're going to have to find the heat input per unit mass. So QH is Q dot H over M dot. So 500 kilowatts, which is kilojoules per second, divided by the flow rate of one kilogram per second. Seconds cancel, and we end up with, well, this one's easy, exactly 500 kilojoules per kilogram. So that's the heat input on a per unit mass basis. And now we would simply recognize that this also equals Cp times T3 minus T2. So, 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. And then T3 is our unknown. T2 we just found above, 527.1 Kelvin. And I just solve now for T3. And we get T3 is 1,025 Kelvin. Now we have T3. Again, this was a little bit different than the last problem, right? But same equations. So we have T3. Now we're going to move on and deal with the compress, uh, I'm sorry, deal with the turbine itself. So we know that the work associated with the turbine 
is CPT3 minus T4. We can't find the turbine work until we know T4. So T3 over T4 for the isentropic process is Rp to the k minus 1 over k. So 1,025 over T4 equals 10 to the 0 0.4 over 1.4. And we solve for T4 now, and we get 530.9 Kelvin. So now we have all the temperatures for the cycle. Now we can just find the work per unit mass, and then ultimately the power, and then the efficiency. So work per unit mass for the turbine is Cp times T3 minus T4. Um, by the way, you could again put a little subscript zero just to remind yourself that we're talking about you know, room temperature properties, but not absolutely necessary. All right, so just in the interest of saving time, um, I'm gonna go ahead and just let you plug in the numbers on your own. We have CP, we have both of these temperatures. We solve for the turbine work and we get 496.6 kilojoules per kilogram. We find the compressor work the same way. So CPO times T2 minus T1. So again, plug in the numbers yourselves and we find that this is 255.4 kilojoules per kilogram. Um, now we can find the net power, m dot times turbine work minus compressor work per unit mass. So again, we have all this information here. Just plug in the numbers and we get 241.2. Um, let's see, the mass flow rate would be kilograms per second times kilojoules per kilogram. So that's kilojoules per second, which is kilowatts. So the units work out the way they're supposed to. And last but not least, the thermodynamic efficiency, the net power over the heat input. So 241.2 over 500. The units are both the same, which they have to be, right? Otherwise, the units wouldn't cancel and we wouldn't get a dimensionless efficiency. We get 0.482 or 48.2%. Um, again, you could present this either as a fraction or percentage. You don't need to write both. It's really up to you. So, slightly different version of the same problem. One minus one over RP to the yeah. K minus one over K. Yeah, it definitely would have been easier. However, I would have had to have gone through every single step in the process anyway. Um, to find the net power, right? Well, I guess that's true, I wouldn't have to. I could just find, I know RP, I, I know Q dot H. So yeah, I guess I could have just done it and found the same result. And in fact, um, you can always go through this problem and you know just validate your results by using that other method and you'll finally get the same results. Um, I might note that, you know, again, every problem is a little bit different. Um, in my mind, it's always nice to find each thermodynamic state. Um, some problems I may be very specific. Um, like on your final exam, for instance, I may ask you how much power is produced by the turbine of this cycle, how much power is required by the compressor, um, what is the rate of heat input, in which case you definitely need to find each individual temperature so that you can find the various terms. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I could have done this in a much simpler fashion, but I didn't really want to. I really want to illustrate how to find all these different states. Um, any questions? Okay, by the way, I am going to give you a Brayton cycle problem on the final exam. Um, I'll just give you a hint right off the bat. There's always some students that figure out, oh, you know, he's not going to test us on material that we just covered five or six days prior. Um, but this is really important stuff. This basically combines all sorts of material that we've been covering, some from chapter five, some from chapter six, some from chapter seven, right? Um, so this is a real good problem that kind of brings all that together. And I might note further that when we get into ME302, which is just, what, three weeks from now? <laughs> um, we're gonna start right in on the Brayton cycle, and then we're gonna look at the non-ideal Brayton cycle, and we're gonna look at variations of the Brayton cycle. So it is really important that you, you know, stay up to date on this material, and what better way to force that than to tell you that you're gonna see a problem like this on your final. Um, it might be a non-ideal cycle, so I guess I better cover that. Um, again, any questions? All right. Which brings us to the non-ideal Brayton cycle. 
So we're still dealing with the simple and still air standard cycle, Brayton cycle. And the difference is that it's now non-ideal. Now, what do we mean when we talk about a non-ideal cycle? Um, well, that means that the turbine and the compressor are not isentropic anymore, right? When we covered the previous two problems and the basic material from last time, it was always assumed that it was an ideal cycle. An ideal would mean isentropic compression, isentropic expansion in the turbine. So non-ideal means that we do not have an isentropic process anymore. So it's not an isentropic compressor or turbine, right? So you may say, well, I don't know how to do that. But, but we do know how to do that, right? When you have a non-ideal steady flow device, like a pump turbine and compressor, don't we just use the isentropic efficiency? In fact, doesn't that just add one short little step to the process? If we go back up to the previous problem for illustration, um, when we found T3 over T4, this is really an isentropic process, right? What we're really finding is T4S. And the only way to get from T4S to the actual T4 is to use the isentropic efficiencies. So this is what we were covering at the very end of chapter seven, what, no more than a week ago. So it's not an isentropic compressor turbine. We must use the isentropic efficiencies. Okay, A to T and A to C. And this is the only way that the cycles are different, the, the only way. If you understood the previous example problems and you understood my statement of a minute ago about using isentropic efficiencies, then these problems are a piece of cake. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that. <clears throat> they will be a piece of cake once you've studied it for a while. So what do we do? Well, let's look at the basic relationships. Um, I'll start with the diagram. We'll look at the various equations. They're all going to be very similar to what we had before. Um, but then I'm going to give you another example problem just to bring this all together. So we still have the Brayton cycle. Um, there's absolutely no difference, none at all, in the schematic diagram. Um, there's no difference at all in the thermodynamic state points. We're going to use exactly the same numbering scheme. Um, we still have our compressor, our combustion chamber, and our turbine. We still have work input to the compressor and output from the turbine. We still have heat input. Um, that's supposed to be an H, Q dot H into the combustion chamber. So none of that changes. I didn't really even have to redraw this. Um, as far as the TS diagram, it does change ever so slightly. Um, it, it's still a Brayton cycle, so we still have constant pressure heat input and constant he pressure heat rejection. So I still have a maximum and a minimum pressure in the cycle. Um, we're going to enter the compressor at the low point, right? We always enter from the atmosphere. So this is going to have the lowest temperature. So it's going to be at the lowest pressure. So we're always in the far bottom left-hand corner. And then if this were an ideal process, we would end up with state point 2S directly above state point 1, right? Um, but it's not an ideal process. It's a real process. Entropy will increase. The actual discharge is going to be over here at point 2A. Now, I, I always like to put the subscript A rather than just put 2. So some textbooks just use the subscript 2 to represent the actual, and then they put the S to represent the isentropic. Uh, but I always like to put the A there just as a reminder that it's not the same as the isentropic point 2S. It's totally different. We add our heat, and we get up to the maximum temperature at the maximum pressure in the cycle. And then we have the same thing, right? If this were an ideal process, we would end up at point 4S directly below point 3 on the TS diagram. But it's not, right? The real cycle has an entropy increase, and we end up with the point 4, again, actual, at the higher entropy, it still discharges at the same pressure, right? The, the, the gas turbine engine 
um, doesn't have a different pressure at 4A versus 4S. It's just the environmental pressure, right? It doesn't have a different pressure between 2A and 2S. That's just the maximum pressure at the discharge of the compressor. So, so there's no change in pressure uh, between whether we assume it's an isentropic compression or an actual compression or an isentropic expansion or an actual expansion. None of that really matters. The pressure is either the maximum or the minimum. And then there's no other pressures in the problem. So this is the basic setup. And then what about the equations? I'll just say, similar to before, uh, the equations are all very much the same. Um, we're still interested in the rate of heat input. That's still going to be the mass flow rate times Cp times the temperature change. However, we definitely want to show oops, T3 minus T2A and not just T2. So that's how we're going to find the rate of heat input. Um, if we wanted to show this on a per unit mass basis, QH is just Cp times T3 minus T2A. Uh, remember that the isentropic process is just an analytical tool that we use, right? We assume that it's isentropic so that we can get the ideal value of the temperature leaving that turbine, but then we have to apply the isentropic efficiency to get the actual value of the temperature leaving. And again, that would apply both to the compressor and the turbine. All right, so here's our heat input. Um, we're also interested in finding the turbine work output. Now again, so that we know that we're talking about the real turbine here, I always like to put a subscript A, and I'll just show this as m dot cp, and then this is going to be T3 minus T4A. If we want to show this on a per unit mass basis for the turbine, well then it's just cp times T3 minus T4A. And of course, we have our compressor <clears throat> Once again, to make a distinguish or to distinguish <clears throat> between ideal and actual, I'll put a little a there. And this is going to be m dot cp <clears throat> t2a minus t1. Um, by the way, I didn't mention it yet today, but all, all these heat and work terms are absolute values, right? Uh, this is the magnitude of the compressor power. We know it's a power input, and if we were solving just a, a pure first law problem, then we would make sure that we don't just use magnitudes, that we use the actual equations. Um, but here we're using magnitudes. And the actual compressor work on a per unit basis is just Cp times T2A minus T1. So these are the equations that we're going to use. Um, they're very, very similar to the previous set of equations. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, it might also be important to note that the net power is just the difference between the turbine and the compressor power, or on a per unit mass basis, the turbine minus the compressor. Uh, but again, we need to put the subscript A just as a reminder that the actual process is not the same as the ideal process. So this is another equation we may use. Um, but this gives us everything we need. We can now find the thermodynamic efficiency. Um, this is just going to be the net power divided by the rate of heat input. Um, we could modify this. Uh, we could just show this as W dot T minus W dot C, again with the little A's for actual, um, over Q dot H. Um, or we can divide out the mass flow rate at this point and just write it as work per unit mass for the turbine actual minus work per unit mass required by the compressor actual over the heat input. So this is how we're going to find the thermodynamic efficiency. I will note that this does not equal 1 over 1 minus, R, 1, minus 1 over Rp to the k minus 1 over k. Okay? It, it does not. So just make sure you're aware of that. If it says that it's a non-ideal process, you, you cannot use this simplified version of thermal efficiency. That thermal efficiency equation, um, if you recall the derivation from last time, was based on the assumption that we had isentropic compression and expansion in the compressor and the turbine, respectively. It's not isentropic anymore, so we can't use that relationship. We absolutely now need to find the heat or the work and then apply it to this thermal efficiency equation in order to get the thermodynamic efficiency. Okay. Also, 
we need to use the relationships for an isentropic process. T2S over T1 is the pressure ratio to the K minus 1 over K power. Um, that's going to allow us to find T2S, um, but we use that in conjunction with the compressor's isentropic efficiency. Remember, the isentropic efficiency for the compressor was defined as the ideal over the actual work. In other words, this is going to be Cp times the ideal temperature change over Cp times the actual temperature change, and of course the Cp's cancel. So this just becomes T2S minus T1 over T2 actual minus T1, and it's from this equation that we would then find T2 actual. So first we find T2S for the isentropic process, and then we use that to find T2 actual using the isentropic efficiency. And similarly, we have the equations for the turbine, right? So T3 over T4S, the isentropic turbine process, will equal the pressure ratio to the K minus 1 over K. That'll allow us to find T4S, and then we're going to use the turbine's isentropic efficiency, which, recall, is defined in a slightly different fashion, right? It's inverse to the compressor equation, so it's the actual work divided by the ideal work. So again, this is just going to be Cp times the temperature difference, the Cp's cancel, and that then gives us T3 minus T4 actual over T3 minus T4S, and again, this allows me to find T4 actual, and once I have that, then I can plug it into all those various equations above and find whatever I need, work, heat, rate of doing work, rate of transferring heat, thermodynamic efficiency, really whatever we need, um, we'll be able to find now. The problems themselves are very, very similar. Um, practically identical. The only difference is that you'll be given an isentropic efficiency. No other difference. So let me just pause for a moment as usual. Are there any questions on this? Yes? So just to clarify, uh, when it's non-ideal, we can't use the, that RP for the thermal, Correct. thermal efficiency, but we can use it to find the temperature. Right, because this equation is specifically for the isentropic process. So we're not changing that. I mean, the isentropic process is the isentropic process. We use the appropriate equations for that, and that will give us T2S and T4S. Uh, but correct, once you find the actual temperatures, frankly, the efficiency has to be a function of those actual temperatures, not, not the ideal temperatures. As such, you just can't use this equation for these non-ideal processes. Um, any other questions? All right. How about another example problem? So let's see, this one's also going to be out of an old edition of your textbook. So if we could have our computer back. OK, nice and big. Um, so what we're actually going to do, what we're actually do is solve 996, again from the sixth edition. And if you read 996, it basically says, repeat 994 with the isentropic efficiency of the turbine as 90 percent and the compressor at 80 percent. So this pretty much validates what I just said, right? These are the same problem, but you just give well, you'll just be given some isentropic efficiency. So if we read the problem 94 first, it says that we have a simple, break, uh, simple ideal Brayton cycle that operates with air with minimum and maximum temperatures of 27 Celsius and 727 Celsius, respectively. Um, it is designed so that the maximum cycle pressure is 2,000 kilopascal and the minimum cycle pressure is 100 kilopascal. That sounds a whole lot like what they gave us in that very first problem, right? Except it's just being worded a little bit differently. Um, like so many of these problems in thermodynamics, there's many, many ways to present the problem and often many competing ways to solve the problem. Um, nonetheless, just like that previous example, we're given 
the compressor inlet temperature and pressure and the turbine inlet temperature and pressure. If we have all that, we should be able to find anything we need. It says determine the net work produced per unit mass of air each time the cycle is executed and the cycle's thermodynamic efficiency. Well, they call it thermal efficiency. It's the same thing, right? Um, it says use constant specific heats at room temperature, um, but we're not really doing 94. We're, we're changing it up a little bit. We're doing 96, which also has these isentropic efficiencies. So the same kind of problem we had before, but a little bit different. So let's just start with another diagram. Um, you know, I don't think I'm going to redraw the schematic diagram, but I will show the TS diagram again. Oops. Yes. All right, so there's the basic TS diagram. And let me just indicate what's been given. So the minimum temperature is clearly at point one, and the maximum temperature, hopefully, is clearly at point three. So these are 27 and 727 Celsius. Why don't I just change them into Kelvin right away? Um, you know, you can solve any of these problems and just get rid of that 0.15 at the end of the conversion. If I just add 273, it's going to make things a lot easier. It'll be 300 Kelvin here and then 1,000 Kelvin here. Um, if you want to call it 300.15 and 1,000.15, that, that's okay too. Um, we're also given the minimum and maximum pressures, right? So P1, which is the same as P4, is the minimum, and P2, which is the same as P3, is the maximum. So these are given as 2,000 and 100, so 100 kilopascals is the minimum, 2,000 kilopascals is the maximum. And in fact, we, we have seen now that we really don't need the actual pressures. Uh, what we need are the pressure ratio, I'm sorry, what we need is the pressure ratio. So we can just say that the pressure ratio is pretty clearly 20, right, 2,000 over 10. So we have that information. Now let us figure out what equations we need to solve. Um, we've been asked to find, oh yeah, I'm sorry, we also need to find, <coughs> we also need to write down the efficiencies. So the compressor is 80%, the turbine is 90%. So those are both given in the problem statement. And again, what we're trying to find is the net work per unit mass and we're trying to find the thermodynamic efficiency. Now again, because this is a non-ideal cycle, the only way to find the thermodynamic efficiency is to go through each state point um, using the equations that were, uh, well, described earlier. Um, we can't use that simplified equation to find the thermodynamic efficiency, so what do we do? Um, well, we'll just start at point one. This is typically what we do, and we move through the entire cycle. So. Again, let me just talk through it first. So we know T1, we know the pressure ratio, so we can just use the fact that the temperature ratio equals the pressure ratio of the K minus one over K to find T2S, and then we can use the compressor's isentropic efficiency to get T2A. We then move on to point three, and we say that the temperature ratio across the turbine is RP to the K minus one over K. Again, we know all that information except T4S, so we solve for T4S, and then we use the turbine's isentropic efficiency to get T4A. Um, once we have those two isentropic, um, <clears throat> sorry, once we have those temperatures, then it's just a matter of plugging them into the work equations or the heat input equations, and everything's just CP times the temperature difference, right? So we should easily be able to find the work per unit mass for the turbine, the work per unit mass for the compressor, the heat input per unit mass um, associated with the combustion chamber. We just take the ratio of those, right? WT minus WC over Q input. And that gives us the thermodynamic efficiency. So it's not really a hard problem. It's the same problem as we saw before with one little addition, which is we have to find the actual temperatures leaving the compressor in the turbine. So with all this in mind, let's begin working on this problem. So T2S over T1 is a pressure ratio to the K minus one over K. 
You know, I really should have solved one problem using British units instead of all three problems using SI units. It doesn't matter though, does it? I mean, as long as you use temperature and Rankine instead of Kelvin, um, everything else is gonna be pretty much the same. You might have some conversion factors um, as you're dealing with BTUs, and sometimes you have to convert into foot-pounds as far as our energy units. Sometimes power has to be converted from BTUs per hour into horsepower, but it's all the same basic equations. So for this particular problem, well, it's still in the SI system of units, but you, you, know, you might wanna make sure you look at at least one problem that deals with the English units or, or British units. All right, so we have this equation. Um, once again, K and CP are known to us. Same numbers that we had before. So let's find T2S. So T2S over T1, which is 300 Kelvin, equals 20 to the 0 0.4 over 1.4. And we get T2S of 706.1. Um, yeah, does anybody else need to see the problem statement? Okay. Um, yeah, so maybe if we could have the other screen back up again. Okay. All right, so we now have T2S, and now we are going to apply the isentropic efficiency. So the isentropic efficiency, well, that didn't quite work. You can all turn around and look at the back. That's still there. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, and, and I don't, I don't need that at all. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So anyway. Well, we're almost out of time. I'm just going to continue. It, it'll pop up eventually. So once again, modern technology at its finest. All right, so um, the efficiency is 0.8. Um, we know that this is, at least for the compressor, the ideal over the actual work, which becomes T2S minus T1 over T2 actual minus T1. And we know everything except T2 actual. So 706.1 minus 300 over T2 actual minus 300. And if we go through the math, we get that the actual temperature at point two is 807.6. Okay, so that gives me T2. And now I have to do exactly the same thing for the turbine. So let me just pause for a second. Well, in fact, um, there's no way I'm gonna be able to finish this in the next one minute. So I think what I'll do is we'll just leave it at, at this for now. And the first thing I'll do then on Friday is complete this problem. Now, let, let me just note again that Friday is gonna be, um, well, besides finishing up this material, it'll be review day, a teacher evaluation day. Um, I'm also gonna have plenty of time to talk about the final exam and to answer any questions you have. And that will include just questions on concepts, terminology, definitions, problem solving, homework problems, example problems, just, just anything that you might have questions on, you know, be prepared to ask that on Friday. Um, you also, I think, saw my updated finals week office hours. I put that here on the screen right at the very beginning today. If anybody didn't get that, just come, come up to the front or talk to one of your classmates. Um, so, looks like that's all we have for today. This problem will be continued on Friday.